Welcome. I'm Madison Dennis, Campaign Coordinator at Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you for joining our March webinar, Safe Drinking Water for All, Protecting Communities from Plastic During U.S. Lead Pipe Replacement. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. We have four poll questions today to get a sense of who is joining us. Each question will only appear for 20 seconds, so please answer quickly. Where are you joining us from today? Great, it looks like we have lots from North America. We've also got the Caribbean, Asia, Europe. Excited to have such a wide day in North Asia as well joining us. The next question is, what best describes the sector in which you work? Awesome, we got a really diverse group. We've got a lot from nonprofit organizations, government and policy, education, corporations, media and research. The third question is, do you use a water filter? And you can select all that apply. Great, it looks like we have a lot of different filter types. We've got the whole home, under the sink, fridge filters, pitcher filters, and then some people with no filters. So we've really got the whole gamut here. Question number four, do you know what kind of pipes your water comes through? And again, select all that apply. So it looks like a lot of us don't know. I can say I'm also in that boat. We also have cast iron, galvanized steel, plastic, copper, and also some lead pipes. Thank you for participating in the poll questions. So water comes to you through to your tap through service lines. Some of these service lines are made of lead, as we saw, an extremely dangerous toxic chemical. Lead pipes bring drinking water into the homes of an estimated 22 or more people in the United States. The U.S. federal government did approve $15 billion to replace these lead service lines, which is really essential to provide clean drinking water and protect the health and safety of our families and communities. As I said, it's 22 million Americans are impacted by these lead pipes. And this is really the time to influence how the $15 billion are used in federal and local government, how they use these funds to provide toxic-free drinking water without plastic. Plastic Pollution Coalition has two urgent recommendations for U.S. municipalities and states to protect community health and prioritize non-plastic solutions. So our first recommendation is filtered, not bottled. All households impacted by lead service line replacements should be provided with options for filtered water, not plastic bottles. Single-use plastic water bottles, like all plastics, are a health threat to people and the environment at every stage of their existence. Our second recommendation is plastic-free pipes. Lead service pipes should be replaced with non-toxic materials, not plastics like PVC or polyvinyl chloride pipes. Plastics can introduce additional toxic chemicals into the water with which they come into contact, further impacting community health. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Brandi Williams, the Civil and Human Rights Good Trouble Department Field Campaigns Director for the Hip Hop Caucus. We'll also be hearing from Sharon Levine, the founder of Rye St. James, Judith Enk, president of Beyond Plastics and former regional administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Dr. Terrence Collins, a green chemistry professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And Erica Serino, communications manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition. So I have the pleasure of introducing our first panelist, Brandi Williams. Brandy serves as a civil and, civil and Human Rights Good Trouble Department Field Campaigns Director of the Hip Hop Caucus. She is an award-winning and accredited public relations professional turned broker for change who uses her diverse public relations background to negotiate opportunities, equity, and liberation for Black people. Brandy's advocacy ranges from environmental sustainability to education and mental health. Welcome, Brandy. 
Thank you so much, um, Madison. And I'm um, extremely happy to be here tonight with you and with all of the other panelists to talk about clean water. Um, and, and I'd like to level set, if I can, to get started. So all living things require water for survival. Humans are living things. And so we need water, right? Like we can't live, we can't exist without water. The U.S. Uh, government guarantees civil protections in the Constitution, including the right to be free from discrimination. These are two critical points that I'll refer back to in just a minute, but I wanted to kind of put that out there. So as I talk, I want you to think about this. Um, and what I'm going to talk about are the disparities in uh, the distribution of water and the discrimination in the dis distribution of water um, to communities of color and why this is a civil and human rights violation, the things that are actually occurring. So according to the EPA, 40% of public water systems are violating the Safe Water Drinking Act. And, um, they are, and the violations that are occurring are more likely to be in communities that serve people of color. And once these violations are identified, it's, it takes longer for um, these utilities to come into compliance. Forbes reports that 43% of white Americans are confident in their tap water. In comparison, only 24% of Black Americans and 19% of Hispanic Americans indicate the same confidence. Only 10% of white Americans say they are not confident at all in the quality of their tap water. 55% of black Americans and 44% of Hispanic Americans report drinking only bottled water at home. Whew. The EPA just released a proposed rule on controlling synthetic chemicals. These chem chemicals are called, called PFAs and they've been found in drinking water across the United States. They are so very present in our water that even newborn babies carry these PFAs in their bloodstream. Dubbed the, the, the forever chemicals, that's what PA, PH, PFAs are dubbed, they do not break down and they persist in the environment and they can seep into soil and water. So as you can see, it's not just um, the water, it's also, it's being uh, served in our soil, which is why it's called the favorite chemical and we all, including newborns, have it. As many as 200 million Americans are exposed to PFAs in their tap water, according to a peer reviewed uh, study that was done in 2020. And so as we start to think about this and think about the health disparities that communities of color, particularly black and brown people, we, you know, over index in all types of health disparities and plastics play a huge role. The introduction of plastics has played a huge role in these. Um, and I, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, you know, why is this so important and why are we talking about this as a civil and human rights issue? It's because when we think about why there is a lack of confidence in tap water among communities of color, we have to point to the difference in lived experience and institutional racism in delivering water to communities of color. The Clean Water Action reports 75 percent of black Americans live near polluting facilities. A 2020 poll by Undefeated and the Kaiser Family Foundation found that Black people are far more likely than whites to report disparities in environmental exposure. It's a 75 to 40 percent um, dif difference in the report. Black, Hispanic, and low wealth residents have reported uh, that water looks, smells, and tastes different in their neighborhoods than in more affluent neighborhoods where white Americans live. Most Safe Water Drinking Act violations are found in water systems that serve communities of color. This is often because other issues that impact quality of water, uh, the quality of water delivery in these communities, um, including poor infrastructure and piping, are present. Last year, the Hip Hop Caucus worked with Operation Good, a nonprofit in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, uh, as they were experiencing their own water crisis, and we learned. Um, a couple of things. One, we learned that Jackson failed an EPA inspection in just in, in March of 2020, that raw water from the Pearl River was being introduced and pushed into the pipes, the drinking water for the residents of Jackson. 
The plant facility's water pump stopped working due to poor maintenance and understaffing. And replacing the pumps um, only, which is what they did, only places a Band-Aid to cure to, um, to the most recent problem. But it does not uh, address the more significant issues of unclean water that are related to sewage backups and outdated pipes and also the flooding of the Pearl River, which is part of how that uh, the raw water from the river is getting pushed into the, the sewer system. These issues have been raised by Jackson's mayor for years, um, and he's faced opposition from the governor in getting the funds needed to support an overhaul of their water system. Racism and party affiliation have been named as reasons for the conflict between the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi. These are long known issues that have yet to be resolved and mainly impact black and brown communities in Jackson. So, you know, I want to wrap up by saying bottled water is um, is necessary for millions living in, living in communities like Jackson, Mississippi and Flint, Michigan, because their local water utilities have failed to provide safe clean tap water. Couple the toxic water that's being delivered through their tap with the disproportionate exposure to environmental pollution, and you'll see how this comes together as a civil and human rights issue. People need water. They need clean, safe drinking water. Their local utilities are not providing it, and so they're looking for other alternatives. So the water systems are not offering equity for communities of color when delivering the fundamental right and access to water. They've been shown to discriminate against people of color when delivering water. This all makes what is happening with our water system a civil and human rights violation that we can't ignore. Um, and so I'm really excited about the rest of the conversation that we're, have, we're going to have. Thank you. And uh, back to you, Madison. Thank you, Brandy. That was an incredible power, an incredibly powerful overview of the environmental justice issue that is clean drinking water in the U.S. So thank you for that. I'd now like to introduce our next panelist, Sharon Levine. Sharon is the founding director of Rise St. James, a faith-based organization focused on preventing worsening pollution from an expansion of the petrochemical industry. An environmental justice activist based in Louisiana, Sharon's work focuses on combating petrochemical complexes and their negative health impacts on local populations in her state. As well as others at Compromise Cancer Alley, she is a 2022 recipient of the Lightere Medal, the highest honor for American Catholics, and a 2021 recipient of the Goldman Environmental Prize. Welcome, Sharon. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we have in St. James Parish, 12 petrochemical plants and refineries within a 10 mile radius where I live. And the picture on the screen is where I'm standing in front of a, a plant called American Styrenix. And they pollute us. They dump chemicals into our drinking water, which is the Mississippi River. And um, our parish officials know these things. And we have like benzene in our water, formal formaldehyde and other chemicals. Uh, we we trying to do a, a search a research on some of the waters that we drink because sometimes in the morning the water comes out in some areas like a brown color and we know it's not you know good enough for, uh, for us to drink because we know they have pollution in the water and that's been known especially from this industry and a whole lot of the other industries they usually come into our community to buy property on the riverfront on Highway 18, where they have access to the river. And also the plant that wanted to come into St. James Parish is called Formosa Plastics. They would make plastics and they would also use the river water to dump their chemicals in. And also we have a lawsuit with them for the Clean Water Act and one for the Clean Air Act. And uh, we filed a lawsuit against them about, about two years ago. And the judge who, who resides in our lawsuit, she ruled them as a, um, 
as, vi as violating the basic human rights. And so uh, we won our case last year in September. They, uh, they are appealing the case right now. But uh, we're waiting to see what they're going to do with that appeal. They still insist on billing in St. James. And they, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is doing an EIS on them, environmental impact statement. We, they've been doing that for about a year and a half right now. They haven't come to a, to a conclusion. But we all have to have bottled water in this area because the water is so polluted. And uh, sometimes when you take a bath, if you shower, just take a bath, sometimes you end up with rashes. And I have gone to the doctor for rashes and um, I'm still being treated, not knowing where it came from, but we, all of us think it came from the water that we drink. And um, we really working real hard to get our community back to living better. We uh, started this organization in 2018. We, right now we're filing a lawsuit against our public officials, our parish council and the planning commissioners who approved this industry to come in here, even though we are, we are bombarded. Um, and also the soil is polluted. We cannot make a decent garden because the soil is so polluted. And we also have um, a lawsuit against them for the landfill not the landfill, the, um, the, the, uh, the soil. I can't think what the right thing to say at this moment because I'm just so glad to be on this call to let you all know what's going on. And um, we're fighting against that, the wetlands. That's what I meant to say, the wetlands. We filed a lawsuit against that. When Formosa Plastics came in, they didn't do a survey of how many plants we already have, how much chemicals are being released in the air. And... I, we felt like LDQ is at fault because they don't assess what's already there. They go on what the plant is going to come in to bring whatever chemicals they're going to bring into our community. And they just approve it. And these plants come in. And so we, um, we're really fighting LDQ, fighting our parish officials, our governor of, of, of Louisiana, because they, really don't care, they don't live here. They come to St. James and they dump their filth on the fourth and fifth district. If you ask them to build an industry on the fourth district where the white neighbor, neighbors are, they immediately say no. But when they come down to fifth district and fourth district, they all say yes. And so um, we have four, seven districts in our parish and I live in the fifth district and I'm right smack dab in the middle of these chemi chemical plants. We have some areas in St. James where they are sandwiched in. The plants are one on each side and the people live in the middle and the people are dying. They can't drink the water, the water is polluted. Pregnant women get pregnant, women get pregnant. They have miscarriages and they also, if they try to get pregnant again, they have preemies. So they, blame it on other things besides what's going on in our water and our air and our soil. So we, uh, as an organization, had to be formed to bring awareness to the public and to let them see what we're going through. And also, uh, we have a petition out right now to target President Biden, to ask him to declare a climate emergency and for us to be able to live comfortable in our community. And we also ask for uh, signatures to be sent to sign on our petition to go to President Biden. And um, it's, it's a whole lot that's going on right now. For example, I have been sick with, uh, with autoimmune hepatitis. I developed that in 2016. And when the doctor told me I had something wrong with my liver, I didn't believe her because I was always healthy. And so ever since 2016, I've been treated for my liver and the doctor checks me every two to three months to make sure everything is okay. And a whole lot of other people in St. James are suffering. One of my friends right now is suffering with liver cancer. 
Oh, we have a whole slew of people. We're going to do an assessment on the health of the people in St. James, the fourth and fifth districts. And um, one of our neighbors, he's in the hospital suffering with cancer and they think it's in the bone. He's in pain right now. And it's just a matter of time. And if I could sit up here and tell you how many people have died, my neighbor died with throat cancer. He was fishing in the Mississippi River and cooking that fish. And I, I asked him not to do that. Then the next thing you know, he wound up with cancer. His wife died with cancer. Then a the neighbor on my other side, she died with, I think, bone cancer. When they found out she had cancer, it was it was in the fourth stage. And our air is so pollute, polluted. The water, if you could come to St. James and see the river, the river is brown. The water is brown. It make They make an hour area from Baton Rouge to New Orleans like a dumping ground and the lives are being sacrificed and we don't think that we should be sacrificed for for these industries to make a profit off of us and just like I said um, it's like an 85 mile stretch between New Orleans and Baton Rouge and we have 150 petrochemical plants within that area but the fourth and fifth district are predominantly black and we are the ones that's impacted. So I thank you for having me. And if you go to the um, chat, you will see the link to sign with President Biden for President Biden. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. It's absolutely heartbreaking to hear about all the impacts that your community has seen from petrochemical and plastic production. I think so many of us didn't initially realize that it wasn't just plastic in our environment. It was also the chemicals that are used to produce it and the production itself that is, as you mentioned, creating this horrifying cancer alley. So thank you for being here and sharing your experience and for all the activism you do. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Judith Enk. Judith is the founder and CEO of Beyond Plastics and former regional administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama, where she oversaw environmental protections in New York, New Jersey, eight Indian nations, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. She founded Beyond Plastics in 2019 with a mission to end plastic pollution through education, advocacy, and institutional change. She is a senior fellow and visiting faculty member at Bennington College, where she currently teaches classes on plastic pollution. Previously, Judith served as Deputy Secretary for the Environment in the New York State Attorney General's Office, Senior Environmental Associate with the New York Public Interest Research Group, and Executive Director for Environmental Advocates of New York. Welcome, Judith. Thank you, Madison, and what an honor to speak after Sharon Levine, my hero. Sharon has done so much to edu educate and inform. I learn something new every time I speak, uh, hear Sharon speak. So thanks for this honor and nice to be on the same panel with Brandy Williams and Dr. Collins, who you will love hearing from, and of course, noted author, Erica Serino. So um, I think Sharon illustrated for us what is at stake when plastics are produced, when they're used, when they're disposed of. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to educate policymakers that plastics is not cheap. Uh, we pay a high price at, at every level. I've been asked today to talk about the perils of polyvinyl chloride or PVC plastic pipes used for drinking water. A number of you in the poll identified in your own homes using um, pipes. And just to get the, the language down, vinyl chloride is the chemical, then polyvinyl chloride or PVC is the plastic made from vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride is only used to make plastics. So why talk about pipes? There's a lot going on and a role that you can play in terms of the use of PVC plastic in your own home, in your own community. We are so grateful that President Biden provided $15 billion 
in his first big infrastructure bill that would go toward replacing lead service lines. Those are the big old pipes that bring drinking water into your home, your apartment building, your business. We should have gotten rid of them years ago because lead is a very potent neurotoxin, especially for children. So we've got this new pool of money, $15 billion. That money's gone to the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. They will then hand out the money to states and then local governments. Why are you sitting there thinking, ha, huh, vinyl chloride, polyvinyl chloride, what have I heard about that lately? Well, you have probably been watching like a hawk the terrible situation unfolding in East Palestine, Ohio, with the toxic train derailment. Vinyl chloride was the very problematic chemical that was in five train cars that derailed. So we had the derailment in Ohio, right on the Pennsylvania, Ohio border on February 3rd. And then two days later on February 6th, close to 116,000 gallons of vinyl chloride was purposefully drained into ditches and then set on fire to avoid explosion in the tanker cars. And I'm sure you saw that giant black plume traveling for miles through Pennsylvania, Ohio and the region depositing pollution along the way. That is the face of plastics in the United States. I, um, I was fortunate to be able to write an op-ed in the New York Times, which ran on March 10th. And I, I try to explain that um, when people say they use plastics because it's cheap, it really isn't cheap when you look at things like the pollution in Cancer Alley and the toxic train derailment. So in the months and years ahead, this new money will be flowing to local governments to replace lead service lines. Um, when I first saw that the funding was made available, I thought, well, surely Congress must have written something in the law uh, advising what material the piping should be made out of. And I was wrong, which I always am. Congress was silent on what material to use in the piping. And then I started calling um, my former agency, the EPA, and said, certainly you are going to advise local governments not to use PVC plastic pipe, aren't you? Again, I was wrong. They said, we're just gonna move the money out the door. We're not gonna advise communities what kind of pipe, piping to use. I want to stress that there are alternatives to PVC pipe. You can use copper pipes, preferably recycled copper pipes to try to avoid some of the serious impacts of copper mining, or you can use stainless steel pipes. And Beyond Plastic recommends that your community and your home avoid PVC pipes for drinking water because independent researchers have documented as many as 50 different toxic chemicals released by PVC and CPVC piping. I wanna quote Dr. Bruce Blumberg, a professor of development and cell biology at the University of California, Irvine. He studies endocrine disruptors. And he said very calmly, PVC is a horror show. He goes on to say, we don't have much science on how much gets out from PVC pipes and gets into people, but we know a lot about the effects of the chemicals themselves. And we know a fair bit about their effects in animals. We should be concerned about the possible effects on humans. I wanna make another important point about how drinking water is regulated in the United States. Drinking water standards apply at the point when the water enters the distribution system. So if you're in a public water supply, the testing is done at the water treatment plant. 
not at the tap. So when the water travels from the water treatment plant through a lot of pipes into your home, into your home plumbing, it may be quite different than when it enters the distribution system. Other problems with PVC pipes is when they burn. Um, unfortunately, due to climate change, we're seeing more and more wildfires all over the world. And when pipes burn, they can release even more hazardous chemicals if they're made from PVC or CPVC plastic. As Sharon talked to us about, we also want to focus upstream. What happens when PVC manufacturing takes place? What happens when transportation becomes a risk? Most PVC is manufactured in Louisiana, Texas, or Appalachia. In communities that Dr. Robert Bullard, a noted expert on environmental justice, has referred to as sacrifice zones. Some communities say they're using PVC piping because it's cheaper. I want to point out when you do a big construction project like that, like re replacing your lead service lines, most of the cost goes into labor and ripping up the street and the sidewalk. The major cost is not the type of pipe that you choose to use. So, we need the public to get involved. You need to talk to your mayor, your city council member, if they are planning to replace lead service lines in your community, find out what they're going to do. Because of the crisis in East Palestine, Ohio, there's been much more focus on the dangers of vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride is a human carcinogen. In the early 70s, uh, hundreds of products were taken off the shelf, prohibited by the federal government if it, it contained vinyl chloride. Um, the science on problems with vinyl chloride is solid. So Beyond Plastics, my organization has launched a nationwide petition to ban vinyl chloride. The petition is directed to the EPA. They have existing legal authority to ban vinyl chloride. And um, I urge you to go to our, our website, beyondplastics.org. If I had my act together, I would drop the petition in the chat. Maybe someone can do that for me. Please um, sign the petition. Thank you, Jen. You're fast. And also um, circulate it in your organization. Uh, recycle the words, put your own letterhead on it, but we've got to get signatures into EPA quickly about the need to ban vinyl chloride. And we're so pleased that we're already co-sponsoring this with the Hip Hop Caucus. Thank you, Brandy. But we welcome any groups to co-sponsor this petition. And my final point is after um, the toxic train derailment, happened, I had a concern that personal stories were not getting out about what this meant for people living near and in East Palestine. So we sent an independent videographer to the community to talk to people. We have an 11 minute video also on our webpage. If you have 11 minutes, I urge you to watch this video and hear about what people are experiencing and most importantly, make the connection from Louisiana, Texas, Appalachia, where vinyl chloride is made, then transported along our rickety rail system, and then in the end, used to deliver drinking water to our homes with all of the concerns about leachability. Vinyl chloride is used for pipes, it's used um, in construction material, it's used in packaging. There are alternatives, non-plastic alternatives for all of these. And then ironically, vinyl chloride or polyvinyl chloride plastic is used for that iconic yellow uh, ducky that floats around in your kids or your grandkids um, bathtub. That's made from PVC plastic. 
When my kid was little, he chewed on that duck a lot. So it's time to ditch the ducky. It's time to ditch vinyl chloride and weave together every step that gives us this horrendous and growing problem of plastic pollution. Thank you, Judith. You have an incredible way of making a really complex problem, very understandable. And we're so happy to have you as one of the leaders in the plastic pollution movement against plastic pollution. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Terrence Collins. Terrence is a Teresa Hines Professor of Green Chemistry and Director of the Institute for Green Science at Carnegie Mellon University. The Institute is dedicated to the intellectual growth and technical education of a new generation of ethically aware professionals who understand and practice science in the pursuit of sustainability from the molecular level on up. Terrence earned his undergraduate and doctoral degrees from the University of Auckland with postdoctoral work at Stanford University. He was authored, co-authored, he has authored, co-authored over 250 publications, delivered over 600 public lectures, and holds over 20 career awards. Welcome, Terry. Thank you very much, Madison. It, you know, it's a truly wonderful privilege to be uh, part of the speaker group. I, I've enjoyed uh, uh, listening to, to you all, and I'll enjoy listening to the rest of the uh, speakers. Thank you. So we're talking about safe drinking water. I'm going to take an unusual way to doing this because just as Judas has told you, uh, PVC actually brings a whole lot of things uh, about our civilization together. And I teach this class called Chemistry and Sustainability. I've taught it for uh, th over 30 years. It was the first class in this area anywhere uh, in, in a university. And I've always had a section on dioxins. And so the... Um, I always begin a class, this is one we had just the other day, I always begin a class with a quote from somebody I really admire, and so here's this one. It's sometimes said that science has nothing to do with morality. This is wrong. Science is the search for truth, the effort to understand the world. It involves the rejection of bias, of dogma, of regulation, but not the rejection of morality. This was written by Linus Pauling. He's my favorite chemist. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, he also won the Nobel Prize for Peace, an amazing fellow. Now, chemistry involves morality. It's in everything that we do. The stories we've just heard about, about Louisiana and the terrible racial injustice, this is a morality and ethics uh, question. And so I'm going to leave the lecture and tell you how I teach my students. So they read books, and then they write three-page essays on how the, how the books impact them. And this book, the first one, Deceit and Denial, by Jerry Markowitz and David Rosner, is an amazing book. It's about the lead and chlorine industries. And when you read it, you will find that a handful of people made very selfish decisions to keep lead in the American economy for nine decades, with how, seven decades longer than the first bands in Europe, for example, in lead paint, they caused the dumbing down of the entire population, and they also killed a lot, a lot of the younger citizens of our country. This was um, the reason we have the lead pipe. These people caused the lead pipe service lines uh, by lobbying very strongly for it uh, 100 years ago. Then there's this. Uh, they, they watch this movie, Dark Waters. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. And you see how people make despicable decisions at the top of chemical companies, the leaders making despicable decisions to protect the money, harming their own town, their own company town, all of the people in it, and leading to a PFAS compound, perfluoroctanoic acid, PFOA, that is essentially now in all of us, we've all been intoxicated, PFO is an endocrine disruptor. Remember that term, we're going to keep coming back to it. And its damage that it does to people is probably via endocrine disruption mechanisms. The next one is this amazing book by, by Joe Thornton, Pandora's Poison, which talks about um, all of the issues of the chlorine industry, the, the dark side of the chlorine industry is very dark. And what you learn there is if you read it carefully and you branch out from it, you will get a very good understanding of 
combustion chemistry of vinyl chloride or PVC or in fact any organic matter with uh, chlorine. And of course, this would tell you if you had read it that you would never do this. This decision that Judith talked about to burn um, the vinyl chloride is amazingly, it's just incomprehensibly dumb. And obviously the people did not know what's in the content of Joe Thornton's book or they never would have done it, one would assume. They have created, this is the cloud uh, looking from above, wherever that went, you have, uh, it can bet the bank, there are uh, dioxins, these incredibly powerful endocrine disruptors that start messing out our uh, fetuses and babies, et cetera, and even us up at parts per trillion concentrations when they get into us. It's ev- it will be everywhere. I think they have created a giant Superfund site over eastern Ohio in western Pennsylvania. Then it comes to the next book, which was written in 1996, Our Stolen Future, by a very privileged to know two of the authors very well, Theo Colburn, who unfortunately we lost to, uh, uh, finally figured out a lot of everyday chemicals are interacting with the hormone system that controls the development of, of the fetus and of ourselves all the way through our lives. And Pete Myers. Now, Pete Myers is, quite frankly, the most amazing strategic leader in public health that I have met in my many, many decades of meeting a, a large number of almost everybody that plays a serious role here. He's quite amazing. And so endocrine disrupting compounds are the top level concern. Uh, dioxins are endocrine disrupting compounds of, ve- of great uh, power. And the results of our exposure to these compounds, I, 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 uh, that simply says that. Uh, the country is woefully immature in the face of this. The chemical corporations have been blocking the government from doing the right thing for a very long time. And a PVC is especially problematic. Um, and I believe that that the, chlor- the chemicals coming out of PVC piping and the degradation, the particulate matter coming out of PVC uh, piping over time is going to be the lead uh, issue 50 to 100 years from now in the drinking water system. And then we move to another book that they study, which is by another great friend, Shana Swan, and her co- colleague, uh, Hagi Levine in Israel, a bunch of other people about their research. We're losing our reproductive potency. In fact, we've lost in the last five decades more than 50% of sperm count in, in males in westernized countries. The slope of the line is is very steep and continuing. And by 2045, it's expected that the mean sperm count will be asymptotically approaching zero. That just means it gets close. The mean sperm count of young males of reproductive age is just getting close. They will be sterile. That's the today's infants. The prediction is they will be sterile. This is not happening because of couch potatoism, although these sort of things might be contributing. Uh, the, we can see the camels in everybody's urine. The chemicals at those concentrations produce these effects in rats, mice, and God knows what. So things that really worry me about um, plastic particles that are, are the following. We're finding them in human blood. There's the paper. We're finding them in the placenta. We're finding them in the mother's blood. We're finding them in the fetus's blood. And we're finding them in the placental medium that exchanges the two. They shouldn't be there. There's the paper. Another one I just picked up today, we're finding them in the testes of humans and in the sperm of humans. What are plastic particles doing in these places, ladies and gentlemen? What are they doing in these places? And so Pittsburgh has got a jump on everybody, I think. It's one of the early cities to go and replace uh, lead pipes. Um, And this is, I did a bit of field work because this is like a quarter mile from my house and people are sinking pipes everywhere. And these are big steel pipes or big uh, iron uh, pipes. And I climbed inside, I'm almost standing up. There's a huge pipe, a huge service pipe. And you can see these things. And when you look closely, you'll see this stamped on. And notice that NSF and ANSI 161. That's the standard. Now, there's this organization, NSF International, that um, certifies pipes and certifies them so that you can, that cities can say, oh, well, we can use them because NSF has certified them. It's voluntary. There's no government saying you can't. Um, and it's all done behind a paywall. So it's very hard to find out what they're doing. They have released their ANSI standard for 2016 without charge. It's a big thing. They do all sorts of things really well. 
but they don't handle they're, they're acknowledging now endocrine disruption but they're not handling it properly i'm i'm certain of it you have to handle it properly. The entire interest and intel intelligentsia of the world should be able to easily analyze something as important as the next century of water delivery to keep the people safe, and you can't do it easily. Got it? Yeah. So we're also getting PVC pipes. These are PVC pipes, just turning the camera around, but in the site, these ones are sewer pipes. The kinds of chemicals that people put in to make those pipes. So first of all, the monomer P vinyl chloride, the thing that burned up. And, and and we already know it produced dioxins and and we don't know what the surface uh, amount is, but I'm saying it's much harder, oh, confidently it's much harder than the sample, higher than the samples they measured. And then antioxidant salinate catalysts it, and initiates, blah, blah, blah. There's hundreds of potential uh, compounds that can be in there. We don't know anything about their low dose adverse effects, their endocrine disrupting properties. We do know, as Bruce Blumberg told you, a whole bunch of them are in there. They're really toxic compounds, including phthalates and organotins that, that are endocrine disrupting <coughs> compounds. It's basically impossible to stand aside these pipes because, excuse me, a multiple of manufacturers are formulating to support claims of serious pro products and they're all a little bit different and even the batches are different we're also getting high density poly PEX, high density polyethylene uh, cross-linked pipes and those two blue stripes you see on them are uh, these are it means that this is a potable water pipe this is going to be a big delivery pipe now it's not made the, it doesn't have organochlorines in the in the basic structure but i want you to think about the obvious things here well, will these be, are these pipes going to look like this in a century or more? They're telling you the, the lifetime is a century. So, you know, you start off being young and vital, and then you get to, to, to be less vital as you get older, right? So do the pipes. So are the pi if the pipes are going to look like that in a century, well, why not keep them for a millennium, right? There, there will be various levels of disintegration, quite obviously. Will they liberate endocrine disruptors or microplastics? I think the answer is for sure microplastics and probably endocrine disruptors. So over time, people are going to be drinking more of these things in their water. We need ECC endocrine disrupting chemical assays on pipe leachates that are that ones that are agreed to by the leaders of endocrine disruption science who really know what they're talking about so that we're not getting chemicals that are messing our kids up in, in our drinking water. Uh, well, no one yet understands what microplastics in community drinking water will mean for health, but it is not good. I can tell you, I know quite a lot of stuff, and I'm deeply concerned about the welfare of our progeny because of microplastics being in our water, and as well as in any in all sorts of other places. We have a huge plastic problem. We have to mature ourselves if we're going to be sustainable and last and deal with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry, for that overview. and. It's really highlighting the lack of transparency there is with a lot of the chemicals that are going into our plastic. So it's not just plastic, it's all the thousands of chemicals that are going into it, thousands if not more than that. And it's also heartbreaking to hear that the scientists have been you know, ringing the alarm bells for now decades and we're still facing these realities in our water system. So thank you for that overview. And finally, I'd like to introduce Erica Serino. Erica is the communications manager of Plastic Pollution Coalition and the author of Thicker Than Water, The Quest for Solutions to the Plastic Crisis. In the book, she documents plastic across ecosystems and elements, shares stories from the primarily Black, Brown, Indigenous, rural, and low-income communities that are disproportionately harmed by industrial pollution and injustice globally and uncover strategies that work to prevent plastic from causing further devastation to our planet and its inhabitants. Erica has spent the last decade working as a science writer, author, and artist, exploring the intersections of the human and non-human worlds. Welcome, Erica. Thanks, Madison. It's great to be here. Um, I'll mirror the sentiments of the other panelists. It's just such an honor um, to be among such amazing people tonight. Um, and thank you for having me. So um, I wanna give a shout out to Madison for leading our Filtered Not Bottled campaign. Um, I have put together a little slideshow um, with a few recommendations here. Um, 
So thanks to Madison for this for leading this campaign. Um, if you go to our website, plasticpollutioncoalition.org, you can access more information. Um, but right now, as our other panels have explained, we find ourselves in a really tricky situation. So as we try to move towards a world with lead-free, plastic-free pipes, what do we do in the meantime? Um, and as we've heard, the production of plastic, as well as the disposal, um, which I've experienced firsthand living near landfill and incinerator sites, um, is a major injustice problem um, in the U.S. and also around the world. Um, so how do we make the best choices to impact, um, to benefit our health while avoiding the worst of these impacts? Um, yesterday was World Water Day. Two new reports that recently came out this week um, show us that global fresh water demand will outstrip supply by 40%, at least by 2030, which is just around the corner. Um, and that's in this Turning the Tide report. The UN report on the left side um, speaks about the global water bottle industry. Um, and we need to note that groundwater extracted to help fill the billions of plastic water bottles that are produced every year pose a huge threat to drinking water resources while also feeding the world's plastic pollution crisis. Um, and this is distracting from resources and attention from funding that public water infrastructure desperately needs um, in many countries, including in the U.S., where um, we're generally thought of as having good water quality, which, as you can hear from um, folks in this call, especially Sharon, on the front lines of this water crisis in the U.S., we have major, major issues going on. Um, I want to also note that industrial agriculture uses 70% of the world's water, as, and industries are also a huge pull of water, um, where us as individuals have a small impact, but are the worst harmed by these issues. So if we have a water crisis, um, and you know that your water is polluted, which, as we've heard, there are, there are a lot of many folks out there with polluted water these days, um, why should we not go to water bottles, which have traditionally been recommended during times of water crisis? I'm going to run through this rather quickly, but I hope you can take a quick look at these slides and um, absorb some of the info. I know it's a lot to take in, but many water bottles, most water bottles are made out of PET plastic. So this plastic has at least 150 chemicals that can leach into the liquids inside, and these include heavy metals and hormone disruptors. Um, as Dr. Collins mentioned, these are having horrible effects on our bodies. There is research published showing that recycled plastic bottles, while they sound you know, green and environmentally friendly, they actually are even more likely to leach these toxic chemicals into our bodies. Um, this leaching, as well as the buildup of bacteria, is worsened when plastic bottles are kept for long periods of time or kept in warm environments, such as in your car, um, as well as in the sunlight and when they are reused. Um, as mentioned previously, plastics do break up into microplastics. And when you're drinking bottled water, um, you're much more likely to be ingesting larger quantities of microplastics. Um, further, whereas drinking water from public resources, public sources um, have standards, state and federal standards, which are woefully outdated, however, they are existing. Um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regulates bottled water, and they will only adopt EPA standards, these federal standards, on an as-needed basis if contaminants are detected. So local testing and enforcement of water quality standards are needed, but there's a huge problem because about 20% of states do not have enforceable standards. Um, most bottled water is just repackaged tap water without additional treatment, um, and only added plastic and chemicals. So as mentioned, you know, these microplastics, also nanoplastics, the even smaller size range of plastic particles that can shed, um, these are in all bottled water virtually. Um, and now it's accumulating in our bodies. I've worked a lot with wildlife. Um, I know there's a new study out showing an inflammatory disorder in seabirds, which also, you know, I know they're not people, but they are living beings and they're consuming huge amounts of plastics and developing um, this disease that scientists have called plasticosis. Um, so it's not so far-fetched that if we're ingesting huge quantities of plastics in our diet, that um, you know infl inflammatory and other disorders will be in our future as well. So looking to wildlife um, as the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak. It's also a high economic cost to bottled water. And um, as Judith mentioned, there is, you know, there's a huge cost to plastic just generally, and it, should, it shouldn't be thought of as a cheap material, but 
if you are purchasing bottled water due to concerns about your uh, drinking water quality, it actually costs more to um, purchase bottled water than to, to use tap water, even if um, additional treatment is sought. So if you're buying, say, one gallon of plastic water, um, it can be, you know, thousands of dollars per year. And, you know, the sentiment, we can't eat money, there's really no quantifying, um, you know, on a large scale, not just an individual scale, but the loss of this most valuable resource. And lastly, there is an enormous environmental cost of bottled water. Um, you know, microplastics are not only being shed in our bodies, but also in the environment and mostly in frontline communities, um, near production sites and landfills. Hazardous chemicals are always released throughout the entire endless existence of plastics. Um, the massive injustice that exists, as I mentioned, is the, a huge issue related to water bottle production. So, um, when we use plastic water bottles, I just hope that people are conscious of how, who and how these, um, you know, seemingly convenient, seemingly safe products are truly harming the most. Um, and there's an extremely high energy cost of bottling water. So producing the plastic takes energy, um, mostly fossil fuel based energy is used to produce plastics. Meanwhile, plastics are made of fossil fuels. Um, and so quickly we can see how plastics and um, plastic water bottles do not have a place in a future where we're taking action, urgent action to address the climate crisis. So what can we do about this? Um, so if you have a drinking water concern, filtered water is a much better choice. Um, I wanna acknowledge that yes, most filters are made out of plastic, but you can compare one filter being changed several times a year. Um, some filters only need to be changed once per year and comparing that to the amount of plastic and waste um, produced by water bottle use is astronomically higher. Um, so I'll put that out there first, just to set, let, set the groundwork. Um, and plus the water from filters is much healthier um, in most cases, depending on your needs. So, you know, depending on which filter you use, there are very different, various types of filters um, and things I think Jen just shared our brand new blog in the chat, which is a great resource and kind of a step-by-step -step guide um, to find a water filter that's right for you. So we just published that today. Um, contaminants that are commonly found in drinking water range from microplastics and plastic particles, um, naturally occurring radionuclides, which is a problem I've dealt with and I'll dive into in a bit to show you a case study, um, bacteria, sediments, heavy metals, et cetera. Um, a lot of chemicals are from industrial pollution, as Sharon mentioned. Um, we live in a highly industrialized world, and sometimes we might not even know um, the, the land that we're living on or um, where our water is being drawn from, um, what kinds of industrial activities have taken place historically. So the buildup can happen over time as well. So compare the plastic use. Um, there's a lot less plastic pollution, as I mentioned. Potentially, you might be using thousands of single-use water bottles per year per person. Um, you should not reuse drinking water bottles. Uh, plastic water bottles, they um, are toxic. So compare that to just you know one water filter unit and at the top end, you might use maybe four filters a year for a pitcher type filter. Um, different types of reverse osmosis and um, under sink filters may only require one or two changes of filters per year. So again, this is um, long lasting filters can last you maybe 15 years um, and serve one person to a whole family. So that's a really great savings right there of the plastic pollution savings. Um, and going back to the economic costs, um, you're saving a lot more money. Even if you do seek out a filter, there are different types of filter price ranges. Um, lower cost filters can be under $100. Um, and again, this will last you years and years. Um, Mid-range filters with filter changes that are required um, can cost you, you know, a few hundred dollars. And then there's the higher cost filters, which are typically installed in whole houses, um, which can be in several thousand dollar range. So how do you choose your water filter? If you feel like taking a screenshot of this, um, I think I would recommend it because I'm not going to read every single point in this, but first find out what's in your water. Um, and then you match a filter to your needs. So depending on what types of contaminants are in your water, 
you need to find a filter that removes those contaminants because not every filter type um, takes all of the contaminants out. So for example, an activated carbon filter may not remove all of the contaminants that a reverse osmosis filter removes. Um, my dog is drinking water at this very moment, so apologies for any background noise. Um, and sometimes recommended are sed sediment filters or water softeners to remove even more contaminants or help remove contaminants in conjunction with other filter technologies. Again, that blog that was dropped in the chat is a really great guide. Um, and lastly, you need to maintain your filters. Um, filters inside pitchers need to re be replaced every few months, whereas others may need to be replaced every six months to a year. And if you want insurance that your water is truly being filtered um, in a healthy way, you might want to test your water filter. Um, so test the water that's inside of it by um, getting an independent test in your community. Here is a good side-by-side -side comparison from our friends at Environmental Working Group um, about what filters remove which contaminants, um, any types of drawbacks and the types of maintenance. Um, again, this is on the blog that we just published. So I know that I have to move along here. Um, so again, do filters really work? Um, when I was young, I lived near a waste incinerator and landfill. Um, unfortunately, in that community, I was exposed to PFAS, nitrates, industrial chemicals, and a lot of disinfection byproducts um, due to the need to treat polluted water. So these are um, byproducts of adding things like chlorine to the water and the chemicals that are um, produced as a result of that. Um, now I live in a community where my, according to water tests, there's less pollution, less industrial pollution, but I have a lot of bedrock. So I needed to um, remove radionuclides from my water. So these included uranium and radon. So if you look on the before side of this um, slide and see the red flag at the bottom, um, I know it's a little tiny, but my uranium levels were above the recommended limit as were my radon levels. So these are related contaminants. Um, and I purchased, I'm not going to say brand names here, but I purchased a $190 um, reverse osmosis under sink system. It took less than an hour to install. I did it myself um, and I'm not a plumber. <laughs> so it went right under my sink. I've been using it for the past three months. And then I tested my water um, to see if this was really working. And I'm happy to say that my levels of uranium and radon were markedly decreased, especially uranium. There's no detectable uranium in my water any longer. Um, and the radon levels, while still there, are now under um, a healthier limit. So just to show that um, filtration does work, and I feel like um, I'm very I'm much safer now and I don't need to revert to any other type of water source. I can use um, the water that I have and feel better about it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Erica, for that nod to solutions that we can implement right now with our families to make sure that they're protected from the many different issues we have in our water. So not just lead, but PFAS, as Brandy mentioned, and also some of the chemicals produced in our plastic production. So we're happy to see that there are ways to protect our families and are excited to see hopefully the US EPA and local and state governments implement these really incredible recommendations as we undergo lead pipe replacement and as we start to build, rebuild water equity in the US. We'll now be transitioning to the question and answer. So I will just be fielding these out to our panelists, our incredible panel based on questions that you're asking in the chat and that you've submitted beforehand. So first off, I'll say, what are some best practices for advocating for safe drinking water options in local communities and globally? And I think I can pass this off to Brandy first and then the panel is welcome to join in the conversation. So I'll say there are a few things that need to happen to support the goal of decreasing plastics in, in our communities. Um, we need to understand what's happening in our water system. I think uh, Erica just spoke to that, like before we can actually advocate for what needs to change, we need to know what's actually happening. And so um, speaking specifically for uh, water, local water utilities in the U.S., um, thinking about asking 
for your water report. And um, that's a public document. So you go to your local water utility, you ask for your water report, you can find out what exactly is in your water. Um, and then researching what those chemicals are and the impacts that they have. Um, one will help you better understand the impact to your personal health and the health of your community, but also um, will let you know, as Erica mentioned, what kind of filter you may need, right? And let's just be very honest. There has to be some, there, there have to be chemicals in the water because we're essentially recycling water. When, um, that's what these water utilities are doing. And so they, they're cleaning some of the most harmful bacteria out using chemicals, but those same chemicals could also be negatively impacting us. And so we have to do some more filtering. But then also, I think um, we heard that the filtration and the test happen at the point of introduction, which is once they've cleaned it out, it doesn't really discuss when it goes through the pipes, what it's picking up. So all of those, we have to really understand what's happening. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and then really start to think about what is it that we want? Um, are our pipes, understanding if your pipes are, uh, and, and specifically not the pipes that they've replaced in the community, they want to tell you that we have PVC pipes or we don't have lead pipes. There are still lead pipes somewhere in most systems. Um I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our school system still has lead pipes and a lot of the schools that serve um, black and brown children. We uh, And so what they did, instead of replacing them, they just capped those pipes and introduced water bottles as a solution for the lead pipe. So now the kids aren't drinking water out of these lead pipes, but they're drinking water out of plastic bottles. And we just discussed the danger of plastic. So what we don't want is we don't want to reintroduce a solution that includes plastic. We want to try to figure out what the solution would be. So it's really starting off understanding what's happening and then figuring out what your proposed solution is based on what you know. Um, and one of the things that we we're going to be doing in partnership with the filter not bottle campaign is teaching local activists how to act how to advocate around this specific issue. So um, if you're interested in that, I've dropped a link in the chat that will uh, get you connected to us so that once we start these trainings, you'll have access to that information and can join us. And we'll work with you specifically on what it looks like for your community. We're also uh, working in partnership with the National Forum for Black Public Administrators to try to also influence and have conversation with public administrators across the country about exactly what we're talking about here. To also, uh, so that when we are advocating for this, we have educated, elected, and local administrators who can help support uh, a transition to not having plastic in our water systems and not recommending introducing another form of plastic just to combat the problem that we're that we're trying to solve. Great. Thank you, Brandy. Um, I'm also seeing a question for Sharon. Sharon, thank you so much for this testimonial. The situation is truly horrendous. The U.S. is behind the curve in recognizing water as a human right. What do you think can be done? Uh, stop some of these petrochemical buildup. Uh, put a limit on to what they can come into your community to bring. Because a lot of the chemicals that's uh, emitted into our drinking water is from industry. These petrochemical plants come in here and they get permission from our governor and from our local officials and they are poisoning us. And some people can't afford bottled water. Some people don't have an income where they can stretch out their little uh, paycheck where they can continue buying bottled water. So some of them still drink tap water. But the problem lies with our public officials and it lies with the industry that comes in to destroy our lives by, by polluting our water, our air, and our soil. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, I have a question for Judith. What happens to these lead pipes once they're replaced? That is a very good question. I, I don't know. Um, I think some of it goes for um, recycling. Um, we have heard from one organization that some of the used lead pipes are 
being sent to Mexico uh, for possibly resmelting, that I think that needs to be part of the conversation with your mayors in particular city council members is not only what is the piping material um, that is being used to replace the lead pipes, but where's the old lead pipes going? Uh, Dr. Collins might have some insight into this, but I, I think it varies from community to community. Well, the, the lead is valuable. And so it will go into some sort of recycling thing, I, I, I believe. Um, we have a massive lead battery industry sample. Um, so I, I, I really don't know what the exact flows are, but it is valuable. Thank you both. Well, I'm seeing a few questions pop up in the chat about the cost. So how can communities afford some of these safe solutions? As you know, Brandy noted that the often these are low income communities as well. So how can we support these communities in getting the resources of non-plastic piping or filters and really what can be done to redistribute that equity? And I'll just open that up to the panel and whoever would like to hop on. Yeah, I, I, I can start. Um, the major cost associated with replacing lead service line is the digging up of the streets and the labor cost. Um, there obviously is a cost for the new piping material, but it is modest compared to the overall project cost. And remember, there is 15 billion in federal dollars available. Many states provide additional funding. And so I think the important thing is to do it right than to do it cheaply. Um, the other thing I, I just want to mention is, you know, the full cycle cost of plastic. I, I talk a lot to restaurant owners, for instance, trying to convince them to abandon single use plastic. And they say, well, you know, of course I want to save the earth like you do, Judith, but you know, uh, reusables are more expensive or even fiber-based is more expensive. And that might be true for the restaurant owner who's struggling, uh, especially post COVID, but plastic is not cheap. When you look at the production cost in Louisiana, Texas, Appalachia, when you look at what's happening during transport, when you're looking at, um, Erica talked about living downwind from a garbage incinerator. When you burn plastic in a municipal incinerator, it's very likely that dioxins and other contaminants are formed. So it's really a matter of who pays. And so using copper or recycled copper or stainless steel piping, it's not gonna double the cost of the project. It will be modestly more expensive based on bids that are secured, um, but you're avoiding also the potential health costs of chemicals leaching into drinking water. And it's hard to, it's hard to put a price on that. And, yeah. and I think we heard from Sharon how, how, how devastating uh, the chemical exposures are. And um, essentially uh, we want to move Sharon and her community away from these problems rather than moving the whole country towards them, which is where we're heading as we uh, expand the plastic uh, dimension. I just want to add, unless we adopt new laws that require reductions in plastic pollution, that's why I'm working so hard to have strong uh, packaging reduction and recycling laws adopted as opposed to weak extended producer responsibility bills that people are advocating all over the country. Unless we adopt strong laws, uh, according to the World Economic Forum, plastic production is slated to double in the next 20 years. So people hear that, they feel overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be that way if we all take action mm -hmm at the local, state, and national level. And the chemicals that are in the water, when you look, there can be chemicals that are in quite high concentration, 
in chemicals that are infinitesimal concentrations, and the infinitesimal concentrations are far more dangerous than the uh, uh, different chemicals have different toxicities. If you have a potent endocrine disruptor, it you can be almost non-detectable and be dangerous, such as, for example, dioxin. And so we, the country will not be able, with 100% certainty I'm, uh, certainty I'm saying this, will not be able to sustain uh, American civilization without rapidly beginning coming to terms with endocrine disrupting chemicals. They are harming us massively, the entire population. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, I'm also seeing a question for, I think Eric C might be able to best speak to this, uh, as far as water storage. So are home delivery water service five-gallon jugs or bottles just as bad as single-use plastics as far as toxicity? Yeah, so I would say definitely avoid storing your water in plastic if possible. Um, that also includes if you have a pitcher type plastic filter, uh, um, plastic pitcher filter, sorry, trembling my words here. Um, I would recommend moving your water after it's filtered into glass, stainless steel, or ceramic, um, which will not leach um, toxins and will not leach plastic particles. Um, many of these plastics, especially in those five gallon containers, I'm not sure which type exactly that is, but. Um, if those include recycled content, again, those could be leaching even more plastics and toxins. So I would try to avoid that. Thank you, Erica. And I think last question before we hop off is, I have 20 year old PVC pipes and understand that my water isn't safe for drinking and wonder if the water is safe for showering and other uses. Basically my question is, do I need to replace the pipes in my home? I do use a pure water filter attached to my faucet for drinking water, but for other uses. And I think uh, maybe Judith or Terry. I, I think it's very hard to say. Um, certainly drinking the water um, is where you get the maximum, are likely to, I should say, to get the maximum uh, exposures. Um, it's just, just very hard to answer that question because we don't know what condition your pipes are in. Um, that, that will depend on the, the chemical nature of the water that's going through the, the pipes. It will depend upon who made the PVC and when they made it and what they what chemicals they put in it. So it's a very hard question to, to answer. But ideally, um, um, while we have it all over the country with water being delivered in PVC pipes, what we know for sure is that, e that even really new ones are leaking the chemicals that are of concern into the drinking water. And so um, I, picking up on what Judah said, this is to, to me not a way to go. Um, and the downsides of burning PVC are astronomical. Again, as Judith said, imagine these wildfires taking up building after building full of PVC. What that means is you have what we've got here in our area, a uh, huge question over are we loaded with dioxins and other toxic chemicals in our area? And the answer is almost certainly yes. So I, I just wanted to jump in here quickly. I would say that um, specifically speaking to the dangers of plastic, plastic is plastic um, and your skin is literally the largest organ on your body and anything you put on your skin can seep into your body. So I would say yes, right? Um, you know, we've talked about the fact that the chemicals used in plastics and plastics themselves are endocrine disruptors. And so the increased exposure overall, like the more that we can decrease our exposure to plastics, the better. So I would say yes to your question, um, just because of the fact that everything that's on your skin can easily get into your, your system. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat too. There's a plastic health coalition that shares a lot of um, the, the negative health impacts of plastic. And so um, that's also a resource. If I can just briefly pick up on what Brandy said, said um, it, for example, the BPA is often a component of plastics as stabilizing. Um, if you, hold a receipt 
in your hand from a, from a store. There's B and there's BPA on it, which there 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 used to always be, and now often is. You can actually plumb into the hand that the arm, the hand that you're holding it, and plumb into the other one and watch the surge of BPA there and find it not over there. So what Brandy is saying is absolutely right. Thank you all for those really incredible answers. Um, and I just want to highlight too that we're calling for the EPA to protect communities and just that it can be done. We've seen states and cities across the country start to implement some of these changes such as copper piping or filters. So we know it's possible. And I just want to thank our panelists, Brandy, Sharon, Judith, Terry, and Erica for joining us today and providing so much useful information and such a rich, valuable conversation. Please mark your calendars for a special webinar on April 19th focused on greenwashing. And if you haven't already, we invite you to join our global coalition. It's currently free to join as an individual, business, or nonprofit organization. You can connect with us on social media to learn more about our work. We'll also be sending out a follow-up survey and appreciate your feedback to help us improve. Thanks again to everyone for joining. And thanks also to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on April 19th. See you soon.